The Naval Academy Museum presents a history of the Navy in 100 objects. This is a series about stories. It's very simple, really. The goal of the series is to tell you a story about the history of the Navy, the narrative of the history of the Navy. And we are going to attempt to do it using objects found in the Naval Academy Museum and elsewhere on the Academy grounds. Along the way, we have interviewed dozens of people who have been involved in making naval history in some way, in recording that history, or who have a deep personal connection in some way to that history. Hopefully, these interviews provide added depth and flavor to an already rich and colorful tale filled with ingenious inventions and tales of daring and bravery. Accompanying this podcast will be a series of videos and photos which have been painstakingly researched to improve the quality of this project. At the end of the series, QR codes will be placed in each object so that upon your own visit to the Naval Academy, you too will be able to see the objects of this series accompanied by your own personal narrative of their place in the Navy's history. And with that, we begin our story. And what better way to begin than with the father of the American Navy, Captain John Paul Jones, and his marble tomb located beneath the Naval Academy Chapel. Taking us back to Jones' time is Jim Cheevers, longtime curator of the Naval Academy Museum. He first takes us inside the tomb, and then we join him in his office to talk about John Paul Jones. Where am I? I'm in the crypt of John Paul Jones, the great naval leader and hero of our war for independence. Uh, the crypt behind me is made of uh, marble, black and white, Royal Pyrenees donated by our French allies. Uh, the, the casket is supported by bronze dolphins and decorated on the top with bronze seaweed. Uh, the sculptor, uh, Salary Sal, uh, did the, uh, the work in the design. Uh, Warren Whitney, who was then building Grand Central Station in New York, uh, is the architect of the crypt. Uh, this crypt wasn't finished until 1913, although the new chapel above it uh, was built and finished in 1908. Uh, well, John Paul Jones was famous in life and also famous in death. He was famous in life as being a great naval leader and hero of our War for Independence, and he led two daring raids into British home waters during the American Revolution. Uh, in the uh, spring of 1778, he sailed into the Irish Sea aboard a ship called the Ranger. Uh, actually made two landings in Great Britain, one at Whitehaven and one at St. Mary's Isle, and defeated the HMS Drake off of Belfast, uh, Ireland. Uh, in 1779, in command of a small squadron with his flag flying from the Bonham Richard, he sailed up around Great Britain. And coming south in the, in the North Sea, uh, he ran into a large fleet of merchant ships returning from the Baltic, protected by two men of war. Uh, he signaled his other uh, ships to attack the smaller uh, warship, the Countess of Scarborough, and he took on the HMS Serapis uh, under Captain Richard Pearson. Uh, Jones very quickly realized early in that battle that the only way he was going to win was to grapple, was to get side by side and try to board the enemy. A um, number of his guns were malfunctioning, uh, actually probably killing more of his own crew than the enemy were at that point. And so he did. He was successful in getting side by side and <clears throat> a Marine dropped a hand grenade down into a powder magazine aboard the Serapis when that blew up Pearson surrenders. Um, you know, later on, well, Jones's ship was so badly damaged in that battle <laughs> because even after they grappled, uh, the British were firing broadsides, uh, slicing his ship in, in half lengthwise. Uh, it sank in the, in the North Sea the next day, and of course, he had to transfer his survivors to the captured enemy ship, and he put into the Texel in Holland, and of course, there was a almost immediate prisoner exchange and so forth. The British ambassador to the Netherlands was not a happy individual <laughs> over Jones, about the Dutch, you know, giving refuge to Jones. Um, and then back to France. Um, and, um, you know, when the American Revolution ended, uh, we scrapped our Navy and Jones was unemployed. Uh, he went back to Europe after uh, to settle disputes over ships he had captured during the war. Uh, while he was in Copenhagen, he got word from the Russian ambassador to the to the Dan Danes uh, that they were looking for good naval officers and he was offered a job as a flag officer, as an admiral in the Russian Navy. 
Uh, he wrote to Thomas Jefferson, who was then our senior uh, American uh, member of the government in, in Europe. Uh, he was our minister to Paris, uh, telling him that he was being offered this job and asking his advice uh, on the grounds that he didn't want to lose his American citizenship, uh, but he was unemployed and, and uh, would be willing to take the job. Jefferson wrote back and said, take the job. So he did. Uh, it was a rather difficult trip, though, from Copenhagen to St. Petersburg that spring. Uh, it was a late spring. Uh, there was still ice. The Jones caught bronchial pneumonia. Um, I think he coughed the rest of his life. Uh, never, never was completely cured, but he did pick up his commission from Catherine the Great and went down and fought against the Turks in the Black Sea for uh, almost a year. Uh, then he returned to Paris, and shortly after his 45th birthday in July of 1792, he died in Paris. Um, although the, his French friends had had his body prepared for shipment back to America, uh, Governor Morse, who had replaced Jefferson as his, our minister to Paris, claimed he did not have money to ship Jones home. So Jones was interred in St. Louis Cemetery, a cemetery owned by the House of Bourbon. Uh, and. Uh, the resting place of Protestants who fought for the royal uh, family. And four years after Jones was buried in St. Louis Cemetery, it was sold by the revolutionary government. The French Revolution was already underway when Jones died. Um, and it was just forgotten about. It wasn't until 113 years later, in 1905, that an old map of the city of Paris was found, and uh, they dug under the street, through the basement walls of buildings that had been constructed on the site. In the fifth casket that they opened and examined was that of John Paul Jones. In fact, the amazing fact which makes him famous in death is when they unwound the body in the winding cloth that it had been put in, uh, the body was perfectly preserved. The skin was still pliable, all the organs were intact, they were able to take the body to the University of Paris and do an autopsy. Uh, the one thing that has survived and I have in my files here are photographs of the various culture slides made from his organs, from his lungs, from his kidneys, from his liver and so forth. <coughs> and um, from that we know that the immediate cause of death was pneumonia but uh, he was also suffer suffering from nephritis, a very serious kidney problem solvable today with sulfur drugs, but they didn't have those back in 1792. Um, so then, of course, Jones was uh, put back in his original casket, a uh, big parade up the Champs-Élysées, a special church service, then a special train to Cherbourg. Um, President Theodore Roosevelt had sent over a special fleet uh, led by Rear Admiral Charles Sigsby. And uh, Jones's casket was loaded aboard the USS Brooklyn and brought home uh, up Chesapeake Bay. Again, a lot of ceremony, a lot of uh, ships firing salutes, uh, and uh, they offload him here at the U.S. Naval Academy in late July of 18, 1905. The current chapel was under construction, so they buried him across the street and or put him across the street in a little temporary brick vault. Uh, casket on sawhorses draped with an American flag and with a sailor standing outside guard. Um, and a uh, cute little story about that period, uh, one day a yard squirrel, and we have a lot of squirrels at the Naval Academy because we have a lot of oak trees that keep them uh, fat and happy, uh, got into that vault without the sailor seeing it, got up on top of the casket but under the flag and started thrashing around. And that's when the sailor saw the movement out of the corner of his eye. He thought John Paul Jones had come back to life. And they say they never have found that sailor. He just shot right out of there. <laughs> uh, April 24th, 1906, they carried the casket into the new armory. And President Theodore Roosevelt, so the French ambassador, Admiral of the Navy George Dewey, Governor Warfield of Maryland, lots of speeches. Um, and uh, following that ceremony, they carried Jones into Bancroft Hall, and there he sat for seven years. Uh, they had run out of cons money in the construction of the crypt. Um, it took another appropriation in 1912. 
uh, to finish the crypt. And finally, on January uh, 26, 1913, uh, the casket of John Paul Jones is carried into its current resting place, and it's placed in the marble sarcophagus where it still rests today. We thank you for joining us today. A special thanks goes to Jim Cheevers, Matt McMahon, the videographer, Lieutenant Colonel Claude Barabee, as well as the rest of the museum staff, the United States Naval Academy Museum, the United States Naval Academy Public Affairs Office, and the United States Naval Academy. Thank you. We'll see you next time.